Hello, beloved. Blessings to you. Kyle Searcy here. Honored to bring you the Word of God this Wednesday. I'm so excited about the Word. It's more alive now than ever. The Word is always rich. It's when we delve into it and get into it that it really begins to bring impact to our soul. Share with somebody that we're here. We're live. We're sharing the Word of God on this midweek service. After this is over, share this with somebody. Share the link now. But once the message is, is finished, I want you to share it again and send the finished sermon to somebody. Become a media evangelist. Become somebody who shares the good news with others who may not have hope. Just go ahead and just share it with people randomly. It doesn't even have to be anybody you know. I want to talk to you today about how to restore lost hope. How to restore lost hope. Hope is something huge that God's been dealing with. In fact, there's a verse that's indelibly implanted in my spirit, and it says, may the God of hope, as Paul writing says to, to the Romans, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's something God wants to do in this hour. Number one, he's the God of hope. He wants to fill us with all joy and peace in believing that we may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. This speaks of an internal impartation where hope could be imparted into our spirit, into our being by the Holy Spirit. It could result in joy and peace and a new level of faith. Hope is expectation. It's this level of belief that causes your emotions, your spirit, your mindset, your mentality to be where God wants it to be, where it should be no matter what's going on around you. Hope is something we really need. But I realize that there are a number of people that are losing hope and that have lost hope. And I want to talk about what you do when hope is lost. There's a story in Acts chapter 27. And I'm going to read to you verse 14 through 26. It's of Paul the Apostle who was on a ship. He uh, was on a ship as, as a prisoner. And there are some bad things that happened on that ship. In fact, a storm called Eurachlodon came. And it says, but after, law, after, after a tempestuous headwind arose called Eurachlodon, when the ship was caught up and we could not head into the wind, then we let her drive. And after running under a shelter of the island called Claudia, we secured the skiff with difficulty. And when they had taken it, uh, when they had taken it on board, they used cables to undergird the ship, fearing lest they should go aground and run into the sand. So they struck sail and they were driven. And because they were exceedingly tempest-tossed, the next day, they lightened the ship. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackling overboard, and they did that with their own hands. Now, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we should be saved was totally given up. Wow, that's hopeless. All hope was totally gone. But after long abstinence, <laughs> after Paul fasted for a while, and leaving food alone, then an angel stood in the midst of him. And then Paul, after the angel, spoke to the people and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not sailed from Crete and injured this harm and loss and this disaster that came upon you. But now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. He said, There stood by me this night the angel of God, whom I belong to and whom I serve. I love that phrase saying, do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar, and God has granted you all those who sail with you. Powerful. Therefore, men, take heart. I believe it shall be just as it was told me. However, we must run aground on a certain island. Now, Paul the apostle was not in charge. He was a prisoner. And before they left, he said to them, listen, we don't need to go. This, this journey is going to be full of danger. But how are they going to listen to a prisoner? They listened to the guy who owned the ship. They knew winter was coming. They didn't want to stay where they were. They said, we're out of here. We're taking off. And as they got there, in the middle of the sea, a great storm came. They named it. It was a hurricane of some kind. It had a name, Eurachlodon, and it began to cause significant trouble. And it, it was there for days and days and days. This wasn't the kind of storm that came one day and it's gone somewhere else. I mean, it was a huge storm. It was massive. It was there for days. But the Bible said all hope that they should be saved was gone. They lost hope in the midst of that. But the hope did not stay lost. They reclaimed that hope. They rekindled that hope. That, that hope was brought alive again. And I came here to talk to somebody who's been in a place where your hope is gone. It's dried up. It's gone. Uh, what happens to a dream deferred? 
Lorraine Hansberry said, it dries up like a raisin in the sun. And some of you, that's what your hope, your, your expectations, your goals in life. Uh, you hope that by now certain things would happen in your life. You'd be at a certain status, a certain place, a certain income, a certain family status. You've been hoping that that was reality. You hope that your health would be better. You hope that your wife would change. You hope your kids would turn around. You hope that your boss would give you that promotion. You hope that you would be stronger in God than you are now. You hope that some of the dreams and prophecies prophecies you had as a younger person would have been fulfilled by now. There's been a lot of hope, but for some of you, that hope has been dashed. That hope has been deferred. That hope has been delayed. And I want to talk to you about hope. And a lot of times our hope gets dashed. It gets deferred. It gets delayed. And there, there's some reason why. And Paul began to encounter some of those reasons. And the one reason is, is by unmerited trouble. Unmerited trouble. When you find yourself in trouble, and you don't know why. Now, when we get in trouble and we did something to cause the trouble, then we understand it. But when you've done nothing wrong to cause the trouble and you're still in trouble, it's more painful. All Paul did was obey God. All he did was preach the gospel. All he did was serve Jesus. All he did was do what he was asked to do by the Holy Spirit. And here he is in trouble. He's a prisoner. He's in a storm. You know what some people think? They think that when you give, give your life to Christ, when you're born again, everything becomes rosy. Everything becomes wonderful. Ne nothing will ever rub you the wrong way. You'll never have a bad day. There'll be no crisis. There'll be no trial. Oh, but the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that those that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, temptations, trials, will find their way to us. The Word of God says we, through much tribulation, must enter the kingdom of God. But when trouble comes and you don't deserve it, it can cause a person to lose hope. Like, well, God, why? Why? Even when I didn't know you and I wasn't walking with you, there were things in my life that were going well, things in my life that were happening without trouble, without trial, without conflict. And now, God, that I'm serving you and walking with you and loving you and are doing good, I'm not doing bad to anybody, I'm not hurting anybody, why is this trouble coming? It can cause some people to lose hope. A second reason why people lose hope is because of rejection they get rejected. That's what happened to Paul the Apostle. In Acts chapter 27, he told them, listen, guys, we don't need to go on this trip. It's going to be dangerous. The fast is already over. But Paul advised them saying, men, I perceive that this voyage and this disaster is going to be a disaster. It's going to be hurt. Our lives are going to be put in danger. But the Bible says that they did not believe Paul. They believed the centurion. And they believed the owner of the ship, and they did not believe Paul. Paul was rejected. And let me tell you something. Rejection can hurt. Rejection can pain you. Rejection can trouble you. Rejection can cause you to feel emotions that are negative and that are damning. They can put you in a place of, of depression if you allow it to. And many of you in your life, you've been rejected. And I, I'm telling you, especially with men, men uh, men get their dignity and their value by what they do. That's really where they get it from. Not relationally most of the time, it's by what they do. That's why when two men meet each other, they say, what do you do for a living? Because our value at times is based on what we do. And that's why men hit a crisis in midlife. They realize they've lived longer than they're going to live. They realize everything hadn't panned out. Their life might not be all that they want. Their family might not be, be, be all that they want. And they hit a crisis. And many men have affairs during that time and realize that was a big mistake. Many Many men try to change careers and realize that was a big mistake. Many men go through a major crisis, but part of the reason is because they feel dejected or feel rejected. They feel no sense of value. They don't feel like they have, they matter and they have a sense of value. And rejection can cause a person to lose hope. The fact that you feel rejected by people that used to honor you and look up to you. Maybe there's somebody getting older and your energy is not what it used to be and your hormones are not what they used to be and you feel rejected in the workforce and rejected by your family. That could be painful and it could be a cause of losing hope. I've got good news for you. Stay tuned because that is not the last stanza of the song or chapter of the book. The Lord has something for you. Another reason why we might lose hope is misunderstanding God's plan. Here's Paul the apostle on this ship. But when God came and spoke to him, here's what God said to him. Don't be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. God said, you know what? There's a purpose why you're on the ship, because I got to get you to Caesar. 
So God wasn't saying you appeal to Caesar. And when you read the book of Acts, you find out that they were trying to kill Paul and the Jews were trying to arrest him and kill him. And he appealed to Caesar to escape them. And it wasn't just that he needed to appeal to Caesar. God wanted a witness to Caesar. God wanted Caesar to hear the gospel. And Paul the apostle in chains and on a ship was taken to Caesar to preach the word of God to him. You know, God's ways are not like our ways. No, sir. His calculations are different from ours. As high as the heavens are from the earth, so are God's ways different from our ways. And God wanted Paul before Caesar, and God said, it doesn't matter to me if I take you in change. It doesn't matter to me if I take you on a ship as a prisoner. I'm going to get you there to preach the gospel. And we misunderstand what God's doing. The Word of God says, I know the thoughts I think towards you, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end, to give you a future, to give you a hope. God's always working things out for our good. In fact, the Bible says all things work together for good to those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. Oh, yes, my friend. God may have you in a place that you feel like he's rejecting you, but he's actually working things out for your good. Listen to me. The way to the promised land is through the wilderness. The way to promotion is through training and development. The way to increase sometimes is through lack. The way to faith is through trial and crisis. God is working something out in our life, but many times we don't understand it. We don't realize it. Therefore, we suffer emotionally. We suffer spiritually. We suffer physically, but we need not lose hope. It, it could also be a place of darkness in your life where things are just dark. That's where it was. The scripture says there that, man, for, for, for days they saw no sun, no stars and no moon. What's so bad about that? That's how they used to navigate. They didn't have any signs of navigation. It was totally black, totally dark. Let me ask you a question. You ever been a place in your life where everything was totally dark, totally black, no hope left? It seems like all is lost. That's where they were, my friend, and that's what they felt. They were directionless. They were tossed to and fro. The ship was out of control. When you read that story, you'll find out that the wind was so strong they could not steer. They had to just let her drive. You ever been in a place in your life you felt, I, I'm out of control. I'm out of control. This habit has me. This addiction has me. This behavior has me. And you're getting to the point you're losing hope. Oh, I've got news for everybody who feels like they've lost hope. And then they were buffeted. They were beat about. The scripture calls it a tempest. Now imagine being on the sea in some kind of a wooden boat. This is not the Carnival cruise ship. This is some wooden boat being buffeted by waves, going up and down, up and down, can't see anything, tossed to and fro, windy, rainy, cold for days, at least 14 days or more. That is buffeted. And many of you are in a crisis and a trial, and you thought by now it would be over, and you thought by now things would have changed. Paul knows what you're talking about. I know what you're talking about. Everybody who's ever walked with God knows what you're talking about. And it's so easy in those times to lose hope. So I don't know where you are. I don't know if your level of hope is high enough. I don't know if your level of hope is where uh, it was before, but I want to talk to you about how to restore lost hope. When you lose it, how do you get it back? When it's fading away, how do you get it back? Because that's where they were on the ship. The Bible says all hope that they should be saved was lost. So what happened? What did they do? Number one, embrace community. When you're going through, man, when you're down, when you're, when you're dealing with issues, don't try to do it alone. Here, when you read that story, the story keeps saying they and we and they and we and we took the ropes and we undergirded the ship and we did this and we did that. That speaks of your need to be with people. You know what's concerning me in this COVID reality? There are a number of people that have not come back into church yet. If your church is open, they have not come back into community yet. And listen to me, we need each other. The Bible says two are better than one. If they lie down together, they both have heat. If one is cold, the other can make him warm. If one is falling, the other can lift him up. We need each other. Jesus always sent his disciples out in two. Every promise and prophecy God gave in the word of God was given to community. The Lord does not want us alone. He doesn't want us trying to do things alone. And what COVID has done is isolate many people. So they stay at home and they stay alone and they don't want to be around people. But listen, you still need community. And I urge you to be as safe as you possibly can, but embrace community. Embrace 
embrace it whatever way you can. And if you can't do it physically, do it by Zoom and do it by calls, but get some help. Tell somebody what's going on with you. Get counseling from a pastor, a leader, an elder. Go pay for counseling if you have to. Do not try to do it alone. Call somebody and say, pray for you. Pray with me. Pray with me. I'm in trouble. Call a prayer line. Call a counseling line. Do something. Get community because community can help restore your hope. Somebody saying, I've been there and I overcame can help restore your hope. Somebody saying, I know how you feel and it's going to be all right can help restore your hope. You want to be in a room by yourself, turn off the lights and get, when you're depressed and down, but oh, you need to go and be with somebody and be with people because the Lord has somebody for you and something for you. Oftentimes, our prayers are answered through other people. Don't isolate yourself. Don't be alone. Don't separate from the very community that loves you. And you know, when you're going through things, it's the people that love you that the enemy tries to turn you away from. The people that will die for you, the people that have been there all your life. They buried you. They married you. They were there for you. They prayed for you. And the enemy wants to isolate you from those people and take you away. Why? Because you're down and you're going through. And the enemy wants to make it look like they're the bad guys. When in reality, it's warfare or it's life that's just happening. Don't separate from community, your church, your family your friends. Don't be so mean that everybody wants to run away from you and everybody wants to be isolated from you. Don't live that way, my friends. Get in community. Can you feel me? Can you hear me? You need somebody and you need many somebody. So get in community. I'm not telling you to go out and get in the wrong relationship, but get in community. Number two, a second thing that we can do is simplify. When trouble comes and difficulty comes, simplify. That's what they did. They begin to lighten the load. They begin to cast things off. They begin to toss the tackling of the ship overboard. They begin to toss uh, the, 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 the um, cargo of the ship overboard. They realize if I'm in crisis, I need to be light. And you know what? If we're in crisis, we need to be light. Our emotions need to be light. We don't need to carry a bunch of baggage. We don't need to carry a bunch of offense. We don't need to carry a bunch of unforgiveness. We need to get all that negative stuff out of us. We got to say, God, for you, I live and for you, I die. I serve you. You orchestrate the events of my life. And we cannot carry excess emotional baggage, especially when you're going through. And listen, when you lose hope, it's really time to begin to simplify and just say, wait a minute, naked came I out of my mother's womb, naked will I return there. Blessed be the name of the Lord. There's nothing I go through. God's not in it. We need to just learn to calm our soul down. The Bible says God's yoke is easy. His burden is light. Jesus said, come unto me, all of you who are weary and who are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Oh, that's a word for somebody. He wants to give you rest. He wants you to simplify your life. And most of the things that burden us are, are what ifs, or what's going to happen, or how long, or it's these questions that we can't even answer. We don't have answers to them. Let's live every day in L3. Live, love, and laugh. Wake up and rejoice that you have food. Rejoice that you have breath. Rejoice that you have life. Simplify and be happy at the small things. One of the things I love about kids, and one of the reasons I love being around two and three years old, they're happy over the smallest things. They can play with one block for three hours. They can play with two little army men, one cent, 10 cent army men all day long. You give them a, a, a little goldfish and they're happy. You give them a little bit of a, a whatever those little drinks are with the straw that comes with them. A little apple drink and they're so happy. It doesn't take much to make them happy, man. You just play with them and give them a little love. I tell you, boy, they they are just they, they just love you so much. They're amazing. And we need to be like little children. The Bible says, except you become like little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Let's simplify. If kids have food, if they have somewhere to sleep, if they got a couple of things to play with, they're okay. And uh, we ought to be like that. And let God handle the God business. Let God do the God things. Let God be God and get off of the throne and stop trying to be God. Say la, pause and think about it. I'm talking to somebody. I feel it. Simplify. Downgrade your emotions. Number three, use your other eyes. When, you, when hope is gone, use your other eyes. When your natural eyes can't see, use your other eyes. What do you mean? The Bible says, while we do not look at the things that are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You got two sets of eyes. You've got your natural eyes and you have your spiritual eyes. 
When you can't see things in the natural, you got to look with the eyes of the spirit. You have to look into the heart of God. You have to look into eternity. You have to realize that God will never leave you and never forsake you. You have to realize he's working things out for you that you just cannot see. You have to realize that there are things that are going on that you're not aware of, and in a moment they'll manifest. Many people who plan to get a breakthrough at 12 o'clock, they quit at 1130. You can't keep doing that. Many times people give up when they're just a few miles from the shore because there's so much fog they can't see the shore. Look with your other eyes. Whenever it's a cloudy day outside, and while I'm, I'm sharing this with you, it's actually raining and so forth, but you know, above the clouds, there's the sun. And I want to tell you, above the clouds in your life, there's sun. Above the questions you have, there are answers. Above all the things that are causing you pain, there's pleasure that God has over you. And if you dig deep enough, you can find that pleasure. Amen? So you, 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 you've got to dig deep. You've got to go above. You've got to begin to open your eyes and see with your eyes of faith and see, God, I know you're working something out for me. You said in the word of God, can a woman forget her suckling child? How then can I forget you? You said the very hairs of my head are numbered. You cannot forget me. And I'm here to tell you he hasn't. He has not. So look with your other eyes. Then wait on a word. Wait on a word. When you don't know what to do, wait on a word. God's got a word for you, but you got to wait on it. Ask him questions. That's what happened with Paul. He, he said, there stood by me this night the angel of God who I belong to and who I serve. And the angel said, don't be scared, Paul. You got to be bought before Caesar. And I'm giving you all those who sail with me. Then Paul knew it was going to be all right. Wait on him for a word. I remember times in my life I've been in a critical, critical situation. When my first son was about to be born and we thought he was going to be stillborn, God gave us a word. He gave us a dream 28 days before he was born. And in that dream, he said, everything is going to be all right. Ask God, Lord, give me a word and wait on him for it. Don't try to manufacture it. Don't try to work it. Don't just go to sister so-and-so and, and palm reader. Don't you go to no palm readers. They are going from the wrong spirit. You wait on God for the word. You wait on God. And he may send an anointing prophetic person who's filled the Holy Spirit to you, but wait on God for a word. Open the Bible, start reading it, listening to it, going to church, watching messages on YouTube. God has a word for you, but wait on the word. And the last thing I want to tell you, when you lose hope, you got to learn to control your emotions. Control your emotions. Control your emotions. Your emotions will get the best of you. Paul began to talk to them there. And he says to you, men, don't be afraid. Be of good cheer. He told them, you haven't eaten anything in 14 days. You need to go ahead and eat something. When we lose hope, we need to control our emotions. What do you mean by that? What we've got to do is subject our natural emotions to our spirit emotions. You know, you have inside of you the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness, meekness, faith, temperance. You have that inside of you. Yes, living on the inside of you. What we have to learn to do is control the emotions of our spirit. How do we do it? By submitting them to the Holy Spirit in us. So you've got peace on the inside of you. You've got joy on the inside of you. You've got love on the inside of you. So just, just say, Lord, I thank you for peace. I release peace. I release joy. You know what happens? The spirit emotions can begin to dominate your emotions. Try it because it can happen and it can restore your hope. The last thing I'm going to say, I know I said last time it was the last one, but this is the last one. Shake the viper off. You know what I've learned? When you're going through something, when you're down, a snake will always try to attach to you. Paul the Apostle made it to shore. Well, let me show you what happened in Acts chapter 28 after he made it to shore. Now, when they had, they had escaped, they found themselves on an island called Malta. While they were on that island, the natives showed them unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire. And they made us feel welcome. And the rain began to fall, and it was cold, so the, the people began to take care of them. Then Paul went to gather a bundle of sticks and throw it on the fire. When he went to gather them, you know, guess what happened next? A viper came out of the fire and landed on him. A viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. How can this man escape a storm and then a snake comes to jump on him? But you know what Paul did? The natives looked at him and saw the viper hanging off of his hand. And they said, man, no doubt this is a murderer. And he, even though he escaped to see, justice is not going to allow him to live. But you know what Paul did? He shook the viper off into the fire and suffered no harm. 
Then they begin to look at him when they expected him to swell up and die. He didn't swell. He didn't die. Then they change their mind and say, well, he must be a God. Well, he wasn't a God, but I'll tell you what he was. He was a man of faith. He was a man of honor and a great man of faith. But here's what that story teaches us. That sometimes when you're down, when you're discouraged, when you're losing hope, a viper will show up. A snake will show up. Satan will show up. And he will do his best to make the worst of the situation you're in. Yeah, the promises are delayed. Yeah, your money's funny. Yeah, your relationships are strained. Yeah, you can't hear God's voice. Yeah, you've been praying, but it seems like he's not answering. And all the things that happen to cause us to feel a sense of hope. You're dealing with a diagnosis. You've given a diagnosis of cancer. You lost a loved one. You're taking care of an elderly parent. And all the things that happen to cause us to want to feel a sense of hopelessness. But you know, in the midst of that, it's not just what you're going through, it's the devil who shows up. When he shows up, he wants to try to kill you. He wants to try to destroy you. He wants to cause you to open up to temptation, open up to some negativity. He wants you to open up to drugs and alcohol and behavior that'll make life worse for you. He wants you to walk away from Christ and say, God's not good to you. Just forsake him. He wants to cause you to do commit suicide. He wants to cause you to end your life. The viper comes and begins to, to share his venom and, and spit that venom on you through thoughts and mindsets and all the negative things that happen, but I need you to be like Paul the Apostle and shake the viper off, control your emotions, get a grip and get back on the horse and say, I know God has something for me and reclaim your hope and restore your lost hope. When we're dealing with things, we have to embrace community. We have to simplify. We have to look with our other eyes. We have to wait on the word. We have to control our emotions. We have to shake the viper off. And we have to restore the hope that has been lost in our life. I don't know who I came for today, but this word is for somebody. I feel it. If it's not for you, I need you to share it with four or five other people and get it to the person it's for. And I want to pray for you, Father. I pray for everybody that's watching. Lord, restore hope. God calls them to begin to shake that viper off, calls them to begin to control their emotions, calls them, Father, to begin to look with their other eyes of faith, calls them, God, to begin to reclaim that place of hope and get community and get friends. I ask, God, that you begin to restore hope even through this message. Let hope abound by the power of the Holy Spirit in the life of your saved ones. I thank you for hearing and answering this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, if this message bless you, again, share it with somebody. And you know, if you haven't given your life to Christ, it's high time you do that. Hope starts when you restore your life to the one who gives you life. And if you haven't done that, pray this with me. Say, Jesus, forgive my sins. I give you everything. Show me what to do. Amen. That simple prayer, if you mean it, it's the beginning of a journey. You've got to find community and find friends and join a church and get with some people that could really help you walk this thing out. Give us a call. We can help you. 334-613-3363. 334-613-3363. Listen, I love you so much. God bless you. We're meeting live every Sunday at 9 o'clock in the morning at 11. If you're in the Montgomery, Alabama area, we're meeting at 9 and 11 every Sunday morning, 6,000 Monticello Drive. Look up Fresh Anointing House of Worship or go to fahow.org. We'd love to see you in one of our live services. Listen, God bless you. Remain hopeful and let the Holy Spirit fill you with all hope and joy in believing. God bless you. Stay strong. Stay in hope. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us here at Fresh Anointing House of Worship for our midweek service. Don't forget to join us on Sunday in person at 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. You can reserve your seats now at fayhow.org. If you can't join us in person, join us online. There are multiple ways to give here at Fresh Anointing. Head over to fayhow.org and click the green donate button or download the free Fayhow app or text Fresh Anointing to 77977. Please stay connected with us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And as always, stay blessed.